Hey friends, I wanted to be sure I hit record before I got started. I'm so excited to be here with you all today. As Dr. Cook, my advisor said, I am the Augusta Baker Graduate Assistant and you know how much we love the Augusta Baker Diversity Series. So I wanna thank you all for your continued support. I have the immense pleasure of introducing our speaker for today, Dr. Andre Brock. But before we get started, I do want to go over some quick Zoom housekeeping details. Today's session will be recorded and the recording will be sent out to every registered guest at the conclusion of the session. We ask that you mute yourself during today's presentation, but utilize the chat to ask questions and engage throughout. There will be a time where you will be encouraged to unmute yourself and ask questions. And if you have questions throughout the presentation and you would like me to ask them on your behalf, just send them to me in the chat and I'll make sure your questions get answered. But on to the good stuff. Dr. Andre Brock is an associate professor of media studies at Georgia Tech. His scholarship examines racial representations in social media, video games, black women in web blogs, whiteness and technoculture, including innovative and groundbreaking research on black Twitter. His NYU press book titled Distributed Blackness, African-American Cyber Cultures was published in February of 2022, offering insights into the understanding of Black everyday lives mediated by network technologies. You all are in for a treat today. Let's all welcome Dr. Andre Brown. Good afternoon. Give me one second while I continue to do my uh, preparation. Uh, but while I'm doing that, let me thank the August Dr. Nicole Cook uh, and Ms. Sierra for inviting me to join you here uh, as part of this session. Um, let me continue to pretend like I know what I'm doing because apparently I will never have a presentation that I do that, in that does not include a technical difficulty. Can you see my slide? Yes. Good. Yes. One and you know this is going to sound funny. I haven't given a Zoom presentation in a minute. I know that sounds strange, um, but it's been a second, so. All right, so um, as mentioned, my name is Dr. Andre Brock. Uh, today's presentation will be Black Cyber Culture, uh, Black Joy and Digital Blackface. I know I promised black fishing, but it wasn't quite uh, cooked enough for this presentation. So let's talk. I've been doing research on black folk and digital spaces since 2005, but the pandemic changed me. Like I'm sure it has changed the way many of you understand the world, time, and trying to make it through the day. So now my research has shifted a bit to, to talk about how Black folk find joy online, but I also study how non-Black folk on the internet use Blackness for their own ends. So this presentation will introduce you to a couple of concepts that I've employed to understand Blackness and an associated concept, anti-Blackness. From there, I'll talk about how I came to argue for Black joy as a significant part of Black cyber culture. And Blackness and joy have an uneasy relationship, one which is further complicated by what by the beliefs about, we hold about what Black folk do in digital spaces. In my recent work, I theorized Blackness and technology, or Black technoculture. It's an interesting pursuit 
because America was built upon black men, women, and children as objects, as objects, I'm sorry, objects of fear, of pathology, doo -doo -doo, and of violence. Blacks are constantly on the front lines of technical and technocultural fixes to social problems where they are the problem. Because America is addicted to the idea that the government and corporations can deploy technical fixes to complicated social problems. So instead of training police forces to better understand and empathize with black, brown, and poor communities, rather than shooting them where they stand unarmed and defenseless, many cities instead choose decided that that was too difficult and instead opted for a technical fix. They make their officers wear body cameras to quote unquote, hold them accountable, but really to reduce officer liability when they encounter possible offenders. What has changed since these, these cities and other municipalities have decided to employ body cameras? Nothing, right? Many departments, uh, ACLU has done a study. They found that uh, the police still acted badly whether they were wearing cameras or not. And in fact, there are a number of new companies who now will edit police body cam footage to make police look better even when misconduct happens. That's bad. There's a whole other bunch of bad things. But instead of focusing on the terrible and racist things to have to happen to Black folk, in my research and in my most my recent book, Distributed Blackness, I almost said most recent, like I'm going to write another one. Uh, I argue instead that Black folk are natural expert technology users. Moreover, their use of digital technologies such as social media helps to create an Afro present, a temporal space that affords nostalgia and joy, not yet the past, but not quite the future. And so let me offer two examples the Negro Motorist Green Book, and the HBO series Lovecraft Country, based upon a novel of the same name that draws on the Green Book. Victor Green, a postman and frequent traveler, developed what I have described as the first Black-authored network browser, the Negro Motorist Green Book. And if you're interested, it's available digitally through the New York Public Library, but also through the Library of Congress. Right. Uh, Green's vision as a traveler over America's developing automobile infrastructure of highways, gas stations, rest stops, and leisure destinations, tangent. Uh, did you know that, I know many of you now, th those of you who drive have gas stations. I don't know what part of the country y'all are in. Bucky's is my favorite. Uh, but Quick Trip, uh, uh, even Exxon or uh, Wawa, if you're in the North uh, or Sheets, right? The idea that you have a restaurant inside a gas station, and that idea was actually pioneered first by a Black person in South Carolina, right? They put their restaurant in the gas station as a way that black travelers could have a place to eat because most restaurants in the area would refuse them service. But as they drove through and they needed to refuel, they could also recover themselves and eat food that was prepared and actually seasoned, right? As they drove through places where they weren't wanted, right? So Victor Green was deeply concerned with the context of white supremacist law, practice and belief through which these highways and byways wound. And his vision was to provide Black travelers with a guide to locations where they could rest, refuel, or even relax. And the Green Book was more than a phone book or a catalog. It's a search engine offering vital, pun intended, metadata as an information layer over maps of travel and commerce, signaling nodes of Black life where motorists could restore, recuperate, and enjoy themselves while traveling the country. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen Lovecraft Country. Unfortunately, it ended after a season, uh, but starred, this show starred Jonathan Majors, Journey Smollett, and Michael K. Williams, God rest his soul. And it uses fantasy and speculative Blackness to illustrate the dangers that Green sought to shield Black travelers from. And it's based on the very dark science fiction of H.P. Lovecraft, a racist author who loved to write about dreadful ancient entities and their hunger to conquer our world and subjugate humanity. His racism is important, right? Because Lovecraft Country, the show, applies Lovecraft's supernatural terror and his racism as a metaphor for white supremacy. And it does so by drawing upon the Negro Motorist Green Book as an inspiration and a guide to avoiding both terrible monsters and dangerous white supremacists. And the show powerfully illustrates a relationship between technology, politics, society, and culture, or a concept that I call technoculture, right? And, and it does so by visualizing how certain networks, like the interstate highway system, are constructed supposedly to provide freedom, democracy, and commerce. And I make a similar argument for the internet. The internet is supposed to provide a democratic space, 
a civil space where we can come together and have discourse. But as you know, it doesn't work like that most of the time, right? From a black perspective, both the interstate highway system and the internet, right? Uh, uh, the interstate highway system is something where many black historic neighborhoods were destroyed to build those roads, right? Like the South side of Chicago or the Bronx in New York City, right? We can see that whiteness also employs these networks as pathways for domination, coercion, environmental discrimination, and other types of violence. But violence against black bodies is not just physical. It's also epistemic in that, don't you laugh at this picture, the ways blackness is represented. Uh, so part of what I want to talk about today is blackface, particularly digital blackface. And what is it, right? There are two different, there are two ways to understand blackface. Uh, one is that whites assume that when black folk were performing and laughing, performing, you know, their songs, their music, their art, or just laughing, right? That, that those were clear and definite signs of their natural and inherent natures. And here's a quote, I should have put down who it's from, but you'll find it interesting. Fortunate is it is indeed for the Negro that they are blessed with this easy, satisfied disposition of mind, where they indeed seem to be the happiest inhabitants in America, notwithstanding the hardness of their fare, the severity of their labor, and the unkindness and not ignominy and the often barbarity of their treatment, right? So that's one way. There's another way to understand blackface. In entertainment, many white, and if you look through the archives, many immigrant entertainers, the Jewish, the Irish, right? Attempted to mimic and convey African-American music, dance and language and comedy, right? Because they were fascinated by blacks who gave themselves to the moment to frolic when their status was most demeaned. Are you hearing black optimism yet? Because I hear it, right? And this both angers and intrigued white, white people that slaves or even poor free blacks, right? Were not depressed and sullen because their lives were hard, but instead were extremely lively and merry. And this confused the hell out of white folk, right? One of the caricatures of uh, that is most common to blackface as exemplified by Canada Dry on the screen, right, um, is the Sambo, right? Remember they talked about how happy and, and laughing he was, right? This and, and so Sambo became an archetype, a stereotype of black existence, right? His laughable man malapropisms and pretensions, right? The way that he would mispronounce certain words or exchange uh, certain concepts one for another, right? But also his energetic manner of movement and exaggerating clothing styles and scholars argue that this actually conveys a concept that has been uh, uh, present in literature for hundreds of years, the jester. But the addition of blackness and anti-blackness to the jester means that this person, this laughing, grinning, uh, joking person also has a being with limited intelligence. As minstrelsy declined and it did eventually, Right? It gave way to a crudity that reinforces the viciousness of unrestrained racism. I have an example. I think the volume will come through. We we finna find out. Can you hear this? It's freezing. I'm just fucking cold. You want my flag jacket? Oh. What are you saying? It's spoiling. It's like a sweat lodge out here. Oh, you're down on that bitch and flat oh, ah, I gotta take a fucking 12 pound shit. What do we do? Make a good time. Make a good time, but there's no way we make it over that ridge before sundown. All right, we're gonna make a camp. Rest up. Oh, yeah. Y'all might be in for a treat. You know, back before the war broke out, I was a saucier in San Antonio. I bet I could call up some of them greens. Yeah, do some crawfish out the patty, yo. Where's the crawfish? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's how we all talk. We all talk like this, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. get some crawfish and some ribs. Yeah, you're Australian, so you're gonna have to get some ribs. Yeah, 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 this is one of the better portrayals. When I say better, this shit is funny. I'm sorry. I don't know if you recognize the uh, two character act, the actors in this. One of them is Brandon Jackson, 
who plays the actor, the rapper Al Pacino, Al Pacino. Uh, and the other one is Robert Downey Jr., right? This is a movie called Tropic Thunder. I put it on the screen just in case you're interested. And Tropic Thunder itself is a satire of war movies. Uh, and this character that Robert Downey Jr. is playing, uh, Lincoln Osiris, uh, is meant to be um, how uh, method actors completely inhabit their roles, right? And so Downey, and his, as as this character, Lincoln Osiris, complete blackface, right? Nose prosthesis, lip uh, plumping, whatever. Even if he takes off his hat, he has an afro on, right? And his beard, right? Uh, and it's played for for laughter, right? But you can see that the playing for laughter is also an um, uh, articulation of this character's really not being intelligent. I mean, I got uncles like Lincoln Osiris. I'm not going to lie to you, right? Um, but I will say that because it was played for laughs, the better part, the reason why I actually love Tropic Thunder is they critique this performance of blackface. So you see Al Pacino like, be Australian. You're not black. Stop playing, right? So digital blackface. Uh, Joshua Green uh, argues that uh, the first episodes of digital blackface to be observed were actually video game players, right? That uh, video game players enacted digital blackface when playing either visually sophisticated games like Grand Theft Auto or Madden or NBA 2K, right? And these feature and celebrate uh, both the physical prowess, but tendencies toward violence and criminality of stereotypical black males. Right. Uh, for those of you who are into sports ball, right, or have played sports on the pickup uh, lots or soccer fields, there are one of the characteristics of playing sport is that you identify with your favorite player signature moves, whether it's the fadeaway jumper or if you're able to dunk I, and palm a basketball. I am not right. You dunk like that person. Right. And so there's something to be said for the ways that we emulate as children and then also later as adults. Some of you grown as football fans still wear the jerseys of your favorite players and criticize how terrible they are on the field, despite the fact that you only play uh, football on the bench. I couldn't help myself, my bad, right? <laughs> or from the bleachers, right? What we, we do as people is identify with people who we hold in high self-esteem. Even if, and there are many racist football, baseball, basketball fans, even if they're not people we associate with in real life, we find qualities to emulate and admire in them. Green is making the argument that video games actually reproduce this. And he really has a fantastic point. Uh, there's a couple of articles uh, that mention that white supremacists use the Grand Theft Auto games, particularly San Andreas, Grand Theft Auto 4 and 5, as Black people killing simulators. Right, So there's absolutely something to this argument. Where I came in, even though I write about video games, uh, where I came in is one of my favorite people, Lauren Jackson, defines digital Blackface based on her research into memes, and misog misogynoir. And for those, I mean, you work with Dr. Cook or you know Dr. Cook, so you know misogynoir is a term coined by Moya Bailey, where she says that Black women face multiple at multiple intersecting valences of violence against them, both as being Black and being a woman, intersectionality. But this term specifically talks about how that applies to Black women, right? So Jackson, based on her research, describes various types of what she calls menstrual performances that happen in cyberspace, right? Her argument is that white folk use GIFs. And since this is my presentation, it is always hard G GIF. We don't hear that soft G stuff here, right? That white folk use GIFs to perform digital blackface when they're communicating with other people in social media spaces, right? Think about Nene Leakes or Tiffany Pollard, uh, Stephen Urkel, right? Uh, Will Smith, right? Whoopi Goldberg, right? Uh, many of those people are super expressive, right? In situations where they're using uh, African-American vernacular or are in situations where their Blackness become prominent. And Jackson's argument, which is powerful, right, is that when white people use those, they're doing Blackface. So let me add another clip from Tropic Thunder again, because I love the movie, but this actually shows a little bit more complexly uh, the ways that appropriation happens in these spaces. Florida, that'll bring me around hero. Man, what you coming out and moving for anyway? Do you need another revenue stream? Your information, my revenue stream currently generates $2 million a year in charitable contributions to my community. And why am I in this movie? Maybe I just knew I had to represent. 
but they had one good part in for a black man. They gave it to Crocodile Dundee. I just wanted to throw another shrimp on your body. That should be funny. Hey, fellas, it's hot. We're tired. It's safe. Kangaroo Jack? I'm sorry, a dingo ain't your baby. You know, that's the true story. Lady lost the ear. You about to cross some fucking line. Relax. You know what? Fuck that, man. I'm sick of this koala hugging nigga. Oh, fuck. The cold out of time just kept it. Big leaves. Get out there. As long as it didn't see me, baby. That's the theme song for the Jefferson. You really need help. Yeah, just because the theme song don't make nuts. Sorry, I I just really enjoy that movie. Hopefully you found it as entertaining. Just minus the profanity. Right. All right. So Afro Optimism, Black Optimism, and the um theories that I've been developing in my work, uh, particularly in distributed blackness, black technoculture, provide an alternative view of claims about digital blackface. So let's start, let's go back to the gift. Right. Many gifts are extracted from longer televisual televisual media performances. Right. They capture a moment either that where a character is reacting to something or is uh, being emotional. Right. But importantly, these shows and these actors are not in and of themselves performing blackface. Even when the shows are fictional or if they're reality, the shows depict characters with fleshed out motivations and storylines drawing from black experiences, even if it's a reality show, even if those experiences are authored by largely white writing rooms and directors. And I mentioned these two in particular because, and I'm talking about Nini and Tiffany Pollard, right? Because their performances, either ratchet excess or laughter, translate perfectly to the gift's capture of a moment. Right. Moreover, the cliche that an image is worth a thousand words illustrates the gift's power to add nuance and expressivity to text or the normally brisk, dry, flat mode of computer mediated communication. So think about emojis. Right. The young folk use emojis much more than I ever do. Right. But an emoji was deployed because conversations between people um, this is something my students have told me. Apparently, if you put a period at the end of a text message, your interlocutor, the person you're talking to, thinks you're being too direct. Similarly, because I'm a Gen Xer and I love the ellipsis, the three dots, to me, an ellipsis strings together two thoughts which may be uh, related, but it signals also that I pause to think and I want to add something else. But Gen Z and some millennials, uh, interpret the ellipsis as being as the as being awkward, right? And so these conventions, right? These emojis and now gifts and means add a layer of humanity and sociality to the dryness of just reading a text message, right? And so Jackson argues that she sees an inordinate number of misused reaction gifts across our social media platforms. And I can corroborate this, right? Many of the black gifts I, I come across on my timeline are drawn from these reality shows and sitcoms. But the truth is that black gifts are a small percentage of all gifts. So Giphy, right? A popular search engine and virtual keyboard before they're purchased by Facebook. This company employed a young black woman by the name of Jasmine Lawson, who now works for Strong Black Lead at Netflix, right? And they hired Lawson who, uh, to help them increase the diversity of their largely white-centered gift library. So I did a very cursory um, search for black, uh, black men, black woman, black child on three of the biggest uh, gift providers, Tenor, Giphy, and Giphy Cat. And if you do that, you'll see that they have, they, they list themselves as having millions. I think for uh, Giphy, I think they have 2.9 million gifts but they only have 160,000 black ones, right? Uh, and so Lawson in an interview said that role was created for her to find and create black gifts beyond reality shows or situation comedies. So Dulé Hill in the Wonder Years, right? Lovecraft Country, right? Uh, Regina King and um, um, I can't think of the name of the show now. I've, I've drawn a complete blank, but Regina King, almost everything from 227, right? To when she was a cop in, in LA uh, to Watchmen. Boom, there it is. 
Right. Um, and as a result of her efforts, many shows, including Living Single, that had previously escaped mainstream attention because of their lack of stereotypical representations were able to be represented in gift form. Right. Um, but Jackson is also, she makes a point, right? Um, people don't necessarily like, I write about the ratchet. And for those of you who don't know, ratchet is a term often applied to young black women who act out. Um, but it also refers to violence. Uh, and often well, these things are all embodied by black folk, right? And the ratchet describes the way, for those of you who have ever had to put an Ikea uh, frame together or work on your car, a ratchet is a tool that works best when it goes one way. When you try to go the other way, it won't work, right? And that helps you, you know, move a bolt, uh, remove a bolt more quickly or add a bolt more quickly, right? But it also describes a situation when you act ratchet in public, usually you're escalating the situation. You can't go backwards and calm it down. There is no de-escalation. Right. And these, a lot, some of these gifts that Jackson is talking about are ratchet, right? Especially uh, a lot of the activities of Real Housewives of Atlanta, although I would also add that Real Housewives of Salt Lake City is one of the most ratchet shows I've ever seen, right? <laughs> then the white women be killing me, right? Uh, and so gifts capture these moments where you don't have to watch the entire show for reaction, but you do get that middle point. And reaction gifts are these short televisual repertoire. So I have a couple, right? Let's see if this works. You may recognize the character on the screen. Uh, he's not nearly as popular as Beyonce, according to Gen Z. Uh, there's no way that he could even compare his discography to hers, but we know Gen Z be thinking, right? There's another one, a woman who apparently is never going to release an album again because she's releasing children, right? God bless her. And then the third one, okay, this dude might actually be a menstrual. Uh, sorry, I've seen uh, the video, This is America, and um, yeah, Childish Gambino is a problem, right? And so Green, Jackson, Green and Jackson argue that the exercise of power over representations of race, right? The fact that a white person can simply deploy a Black reaction when they're talking with their friends or in other spaces is the libidinal tension behind digital Blackface. But here's the thing, right? Uh, I don't know if you know uh, the once popular pundit, Andrew Sullivan, right? Uh, and Sullivan says something, even a broken clock is right twice a day. That's not what he said, but he says something because I usually disagree with him that white Americans don't know how black they are. That is, they're bringing black folk to the shores of this continent and then living among them, doing terrible things to them, but also having children by them, right? Means that it has colored their entire lives right? Whether that color is fear or eros, right? And Toni Morrison says the same thing. She calls this phenomenon in her fantastic book, Playing in the Dark, American Africanism. She notes that many classics of American literature draw upon a fascination with the explicit body of the Negro or the implicit darkness embodied by Black folk to embellish for their white characters desire, hatred, sexuality, and even transcendence. So think about Will Smith as Bagger Vance or um, uh, who played John Coffey? The, 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 the gentleman has left us behind, right? But think about, uh, in many cases, you'll see a magical Negro in many white movies who helps white people transcend their dull, boring lives and brings them to a, a place of higher uh, understanding and learning, right? But Black optimism, recognizes the power of racism and modernity, well, but I will not relinquish agency to it. Instead of seeing the use of gifts as appropriation over control of Black bodies, an Afro-optimistic perspective suggests that Black culture serves as an emotional anchor for as, and cultural referent in American culture, not just for Black folk. And this is the point where I stop. And if you were in the room with me, I would ask you to raise your hands as a Black person if you've ever used a gift of a white person. The answer is yes, because there's a lot of white people gifts, right? Does that mean you're trying to pass? Probably not, right? And so while the use of reaction gifts can be used by bad actors, right? In the same way that the term woke has been co-opted by conservatives and the alt-right, it doesn't mean that the mundane quotidian use of them is the same thing as performing blackface. So 
Let me talk a little bit more about uh, digital optimism. Once again, I should have issued content warnings. This video contains profane language and rap music. So if that's not your jam, you might want to turn it down a little bit. So I studied Black online identity since AOL uh, to Black Twitter and hopefully whatever comes next. Right. And my focus these days, as I've mentioned, goes beyond acceptable modes of Blackness, right, such as respectability or existence, to argue that without Black joy, without optimism, respectability and resistance will be carceral. All right. Let me offer a brief example of things I study. This video is of a sci American Sign Language interpreter. She's famous if you have TikTok, right? Who works with music music festivals such as Rolling Loud and has toured with Megan the Stallion and other people. And I find this lady's joy to be infectious, and I'll show you why. Yeah, I keep my friends on my mind to repent. I need me some Jesus in my life. Hey, for the phone, but I love me on three. D O M D L E, this shit my little secret. He trying to dish me to blow up my people. I can't respond with just blowing your people. If I let some rats on the bench, you can keep it. This shit getting deeper and deeper. I dig it. My shovel won't be, and I was blue headed to fix it. A shark in the water, you swim with the little thing. I hate the day by tomorrow, she miss it. I grab a net, she look up, then I kiss it. I'm not a goat, but I feed the description. I like the post, so I get the description. We walk around with them bears, and I bitch it. This gun ain't gonna jam, and I blow, I ain't missing. I'm dropping hit out the hit, I'm just chilling, but I'm sitting here while I Chill, my children, the bigger the business, the bigger the office. I fuck around and find me a shred and I call up, they call for my artists, they making me offers. I don't even burn. I start from the bottom. I lost a Ferrari, Las Vegas, no bother. I woke up the following day and went harder. I'm cracking my shit out. They see that I'm smarter. I got to get money. I love to get charter. I gave a four burgers and one sports. If I can't let them down, I'm going to my car. I'm streaming out. Yo, yeah, that's still the model. I know I can yell some shit. If that ain't got sense, I got sense on my mind. So I showed this to an older colleague. And their first response was, couldn't you find something less profane, right? Less ratchet, right? To demonstrate your observation of black joy. And I'm actually like, the ratchetry is the point, right? This young lady, and granted, she's an attractive young lady, right? Is doing something that many people are not aware of. So y'all may have heard of American Sign Language. You may not be aware that Black American Sign Language is not 100% identical to American Sign Language because it incorporates Black embodied concepts and slang that Black people use every day. I would also add that she's graceful, she's inventive, right? And she has a personality that leaps out of the screen, right, to articulate the crudeness of the lyrics, the sexuality and the violence of the lyrics in a way that I argue signals black optimism, right? And so I argue that blackness can manifest in digital spaces without needing a particular, a physical body to become legible because black folk bring an excess of life to everything that we do. Now, that argument about why use that ratchet stuff to illustrate, make your point, draws from a quality that I call anti-Blackness. And anti-Blackness is part of this uh, really popular formation at the moment, this theoretical concept called Afro-pessimism. And if you're, not, if you're not clued in, Afro-pessimism theorizes that Blackness is unable to live with or even be understood, be in, I'm sorry, to live with or be understood as human in Western society and culture. Right. So anti-Blackness, is the animating power behind racism's enforcement. And I say this because anti-Blackness is global, right? Anti-Blackness happens in China. Anti-Blackness happens in India. Anti-Blackness happens on the African continent. Uh, and actually it's happened everywhere. So one of the, if you've ever had to read, been forced to read Jonathan Swift, right? Uh, they used to depict the Irish who are about as pale as pale can get. They don't get no sun, right? They used to depict the Irish as brutish, meaning they had low sloping foreheads and dark skinned, right? That's before they brought black people here, right? And so anti-blackness is that force, that libidinal energy that animates racism, right? So racism helps us to understand why and how Europeans forcibly imported Africans to another country, I'm sorry, another continent as an enslaved labor, even as they use our bodies to underwrite claims of whiteness as humanity, while anti-Blackness is the phenomenon that tells us why that racism happened. Oops, maybe I should have put that on the screen. Uh, you'll be all right. All right. So, um, in current mainstream discourse, because AI is now a thing, uh, before that it was crypto, I'm sorry, before that was VR, 
after that, before that was cryptocurrency, before that was big data. So one of the things I, I talk about in my classes is the idea that data does not necessarily represent who you are. And this is not an original thought. I will not claim it to be. But part of it is I draw upon the work of France Fanon. Right. And France Fanon had a moment where he was in Martinique walking down the street, minding his black ass business. And this white woman and her child were shopping at a grocery, picking up, picking over fruit. And the black, the, the young white boy turned, saw him and said, look, mama, a Negro. Right. And Fanon calls this a phenomenological return. Right. For those of you who are culture theorists, uh, you may be familiar with Althusser. Right. And talking about the hail. Right. And he argues that this is a fixed perception of self that gets inflicted upon black folk. Him being called a Negro froze him in his body. And it's inflicted upon Blackness by modernity and white supremacy, right? And so I argue, drawing upon some other philosophers, that that hail, that recognition, is a record of what should be and has been under that regime. But identity is what one does after that. So my example for my students is uh, trying to fly with an expired license. I'm, I'm probably the only person on this entire call who's tried to do that. But if you've ever tried to fly with an expired license, one that has your picture and your current address, but you didn't renew it before your birthday and you try to get it on this flight, they will not let you fly. I don't care how much you look like that picture, right? Because that picture is a record of you being a citizen and post 9-11 having verified through your birth certificate that you are an American citizen that allows you to take advantage of transport, right? But identity is what you do above and around that. And so uh, I use this example to say I'm a racial racial realist, right? Uh, and this I'm pulling from Derek Bell, the father of critical race theory. I acknowledge the permanence of Blackness as a subordinate status in American culture, but acknowledging it enables me to avoid despair by freeing me to imagine and implement racial strategies that can bring fulfillment and even triumph. Right. And my arguments in my book, Distributed Blackness, right, are that style and invention, what you do after the hail, are crucial components of Black identity. They are how Black folk negotiate the informational, your driver's license, and institutional redlining regimes of anti Blackness. Right. While they are not solutions to the problems of surveillance, the carceral state, and modernity, right, they are instead modes of being that encourage Black folk to live life to the fullest, even though we know they streets is watching. Right. So uh, talking through anti-Blackness, Afro-pessimism, theorizing Afro-optimism, I found a, a different way to explain Afro-optimism thanks to this TikTok video. I don't know if you guys can still see TikTok in South Carolina, uh, uh, but I found this video uh, where a young poet who holds degrees in engineering, electrical engineering and engineering management, right, made this really sublime argument. Let me play it for you. So today I'm thinking about how black goodbyes aren't actually goodbyes. Like more often than not, they're not definite at all. Like there's a lot of see you laters, catch you laters, I then I'll call you back. And if you're ever actually expecting a call back here for a wild surprise. <laughs> but the reason this kind of fascinates me is because we're all promising each other the idea of a tomorrow. Like I think for this reason alone, black goodbyes are revolutionary. Like how can black and brown people exist in a world that constantly takes their lives, but then think to promise each other the idea of a tomorrow. That's insane. And it also gives me a lot of hope. So purely and simply, I, I think Black goodbye is an act of resistance. It's saying F you to a world that often demands that we live inside of our trauma and that often mines our trauma for profit. It's saying to that world, I'll see you tomorrow, bright and early, and there's nothing you can do about it. Crazy. I will say I will never see anybody bright and early. I don't even believe in AM. It's a construct. I'm sorry. Uh, so this is an elegant, elegant way to understand Afro-optimism, right? Which argues that Blackness is not so, just social death, right? Instead, Afro-optimism, Black optimism is a celebration of Black thought and life. Think of it as a second line. Or for those of you who are not from New Orleans, think of it as a repass, right? That gathering that you have after a funeral, right? Where people come together and commemorate the person they just lost through food, and community and love, right? Yes, you may have the cousin who sneaks outside uh, after a while to go get their smoke, or you may have the auntie who's too fly to cook and shows up in her red bottoms bringing cups, right? Because they won't let her do the potato salad because last time she did it, she put raisins in it, right? But all those are expressions of Black life. We all still come together to celebrate each other, 
I don't know how many times I've said in the last five years, three years, right? I wish that we didn't have to come together like this. I wish we came together more often, right? We shouldn't have to do this around death, right? That's black life. That's black optimism. So I think about it as an excess of life that helps us navigate both anti-blackness and the racisms of everyday life as black folk in the world. So uh, my intention for my research stream across the last 15 years was to step away from Western norms of digital practice, right? The norm, the assumption, right? The normative assumption that being modern and online must always be productive, hygienic, and efficient, right? And Du Bois, who is always, as always, ahead of us all, right? Um, when talking about double consciousness, this is a formulation that argues implicitly that these norms are held by mainstream society. The thing that is always interested, interesting to me is that these norms are often held also by the conservative elements of black culture or respectability politics, where they always want Other their- Other dogs, can we straighten up and do your hair? Uh-oh. Somebody got their mic on. That wasn't me. Where, where people who promote Black respectability want their children and their cousins in them to act better. And I saw one of the best rebuttals to that on Twitter. Somebody said, you know, in response to somebody saying, why don't y'all pull y'all pants up? They're like, well, you know, Martin Luther King got shot in a three-piece suit. Just because we dress better doesn't mean they'll treat us better, right? And so I argue that respectability is not the way. To be fair, Modernity and racial capitalism is not the way either. So I love Trisha Hersey, who does the NAP ministry, where she talks about rest is resistance, which I would I push against and I say, no, rest is life, right? So distributed blackness examines the messiness and ratchetness of black mundane and digital environments, right? And so I talk black optimism. Now, on this slide, I offer one of the most compelling articulations of the black mundane and optimism, right, in recent memory. And so this example highlights the expressivity and invention in online blackness. In this phrase, hashtag black girl magic, which, which was created by Kashawn Thompson back in 2014. And I see these qualities listed on this slide as aspects of Afro-optimism, right? Of Black joy and of a Black post-present. And I'll read some of them to you, right? Uh, because there's a lot of text on the slide. And Kashawn Thompson describes Black girl magic as being about Black girls that do hair in their kitchen. Disabled Black girls, lesbian Black girls, fat Black girls. Poor Black girls. Black girls with relaxers and weaves. Black girls that are single mothers. Black girls that have not yet fingered, figured out how to blend their makeup. Black girls that are incarcerated, trans black girls, teenage black girls, undereducated black girls, black girls that work low paying jobs or that present as masculine, right? And these proclamations, these banal articulations, calling out people who are normally unseen and un, un, uh, ignored by mainstream society, assemble and embody blackness captured by the hashtag right, which makes it digital, as illustrating an Afro present where the Black mundane and our capacity to invent something out of nothing becomes inscribed in the digital for a distributed, communitarian, virtual Black cultural space. So in conclusion, it's complicated, right? Uh, I'm often asked how my research will solve racism, and my answer is it can't, right? Uh, and I say this because I teach my students that there's a difference between a problem and a problematic. A problem can be solved, right? But problematics are a space where we interrogate and investigate complex concepts. So racism is a problematic. It is so deeply vested in the ways that the world is signified and represented that I don't believe it will be eradicated in my lifetime or that of my unborn great, great, great grandchildren. Nevertheless, though, asking questions about how racism gets enacted both online and offline has been my life's work and trying to understand how people thrive despite racism is my passion. So in my book, I argue that without black joy, a collective reanimation of care and self repair that we share and self that we share in collectively, we would not be able to come together to fight oppression or resist injustice. Right. As the eminent philosopher Cat Williams says, some thugs wake up angry every day. You mad at breakfast, my N-word? You gang banging on bacon? Bacon is delicious, right? Activists have to, activists love pancakes too, right? So we must hold space for the things that bring us life and joy. And Twitter has been that space for me for over a decade, although I don't know how much longer that's gonna last, right? But I challenge you to identify the aspects of your online and offline life that bring you joy and embrace those things. If you want to read more, my book is available for free online. Uh, my press doesn't think I need to get royalties, so they have it available open source and available for download in PDF 
and an EPUB, depending on how you prefer to do your online reading. And this next slide should have, yes, the, the email, I'm sorry, the website address where you can get that thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brock. I put a note, so y'all free, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. We do have a couple questions that were sent to me. Um, the first one being, this is from Chris. Do you think some people's problems with ratchetry has connections to respectability? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, yes. Um, I, in the book, I argue that respectability is a response to both ratchetry and racism, right? And I see it as carceral um, because uh, I don't know how far you go back with your understanding of respectability, but there, one of the ways that it was enacted uh, was when folk became, became, began coming up to Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, from South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana, and Black women would meet them, usually Black women, either in women's societies or from churches. They would meet these folk who were coming off the train, fleeing fascism in the South, and the first thing they would say to them is, make sure you wash your kids. Make mm -hmm. sure your kitchen clean, right? And this is why I say hygiene is a really big part. Pull your pants up, right? Because they felt like we can't be embarrassed by you country folk coming up here, talking all slow and acting like you don't have running water no more, right? I need you to embrace the standards of modernity so that we, they said all, right? But they really meant themselves can can be considered a part of this civil society, right? And so, yeah, they're, they're, they're inescapable, right? Because it's a response to how openly we live our lives. Thank you. This next question is from Jenny. Um, Jenny writes, where will Black Twitter go once the Twitter slash X paywall is actualized? We ain't, oh, she didn't say it like this, but I'm going to say it like <laughs> I'm going to say it like that, Jenny. We ain't paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so apparently the whole payment thing is a hoax. Uh, it's actually a callback to how Elon wanted to uh, call PayPal X.com. He wants to make it a payment processor like um, PayPal, right? He wants you to be able to use it as a virtual bank or a payment processing system so you can send money like Venmo or Cash App or whatever, right? So he doesn't want you to pay for it, but who knows? He a, he a whole mess. Um, I have been calling what's been happening since Elon took over a digital diaspora. Uh, and in this, I'm echoing the work of Anna Everett, who wrote about this uh, 20 years ago, right? And it's sending us to places uh, that are as yet still kind of in the in the building stage. Uh, and people are hoping that it will immediately, once Black people get there, become Twitter. But they forget that Twitter wasn't really the Twitter that we know until like 2014 or 15 when we were still mourning Trayvon and were shocked by the fact that they left Michael Brown on the ground for six hours after they shot and killed him, right? So it takes a while to get there, right? But every alternative that has been put out so far is problematic, right? Blue Sky is really just a tech uh, beta, right? They had no, I, they have no real understanding of trust and safety, which is how, you know, you make sure that your community um, is basically can have conversations that are civil, right? And so people have called them out for that. Uh, Mastodon is kind of inscrutable, right? The idea, and plus the idea that if you send a, if you post a DM on Mastodon, everybody on the server can read it, right? Um, what's the other one? Blue Sky, Mastodon, Spoutable, which is created by a black man. Uh, he's an asshole. I'm sorry. He is a difficult person to work with and has actually tried to dox people who criticize the way he's run the platform. And by doxing, I mean, he's tried to publish their personal information as a way to shame them. And then there's Spill. Spill is interesting to me because Spill was created with the idea that it wasn't the words on Twitter that brought us together. It was the memes and GIFs and videos. And so they have a visual focus. And I'm old. I don't want to be watching all the flashing videos and stuff going on, right? And so I think they will all take time to both stabilize and to attract a large enough body of Black users to in order to replace what I've been calling Twitter for the last few months, which is the world's largest Black group chat. Mm. And so it, it'll happen, but I I just say, well, I'm, I'm going to be here till the wheels fall off, right? Until I, I can tell that, you know, we've completely just abandoned this place to uh, random ads from Chinese manufacturers and uh, uh, Blue Lives Matter uh, uh, campaigns, I'm going to be here. Uh, and I really feel justified in that because people thought Twitter was dead. Matter of fact, I got an interview to by somebody who wanted to, me to tell them that Twitter was dead. And then Montgomery happened. Mm -hmm. 
right? And so it, it's it's coming, but it's not anytime soon. So this next question is from our good brother, Randy, who asks, as readers, students, and scholars who are really um, inspired by your research and your insight, what role can we play in this work? As readers? As students, he's a student. So students, scholars, readers. So buy my book, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, keep an open mind. Right. Um, one of the things, and Du Bois wrote about this in Dusk of Dawn, one of the things that Black people really feel um, justified in saying is that Black people ain't about nothing, right? Because they feel they have uh, experience. They still, even if they've made it out the hood, they still are supporting family members who have not, that are criming or just not working and being lazy and stuff. And so I, I ask you to resist that particular formulation. That's a lower class version of respectability politics. And instead recognize that it's hard out here, right? Uh, I just, I'm in Iowa right now uh, and gas prices are the same here as they are in Atlanta. Right. I never expected that. I should be the gas should be cheaper because this is where they grow the corn for the ethanol. Right. They also don't pay as much as in Atlanta, but the rents are about the same. Um, all right. And so things are hard everywhere. And having one job is not enough to afford an apartment. So many younger folk and people my age have moved back in with their parents. That doesn't mean we're lazy. Uh, somebody on Twitter pointed out that uh, I make good money, but my rent went from sixteen hundred in twenty twenty one to twenty three hundred. No amount of saving money. No amount of not eating avocado toast will help me negotiate this particular circumstance. So keep an open mind when the impulse or the atmosphere around you is to highlight black pathology and deviance. I'm not saying argue with those folks because you're not going to be able to argue with their feelings. But in your scholarship, look for ways that black people are doing resistance and resilience fine, but more than resistance and resilience, they're doing black life. And that black life may be complicated, it may be nuanced, but more people doing the work that Cook and I do, right, I think opens up the world to more nuanced understandings of how black people are people first and black is part of our identity. Thank you. This question in the chat says, where does this work intersect with digital citizenship education or the lack thereof? It don't. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> only, only because there's a really robust uh, uh, area of scholarship that talks about digital citizenship that has been largely engendered by 9-11, right? Uh, the fact that those men uh, basically forged identities and were able to get pilot's license and do what they did, right? And so it's interesting to me, but I also live in a country, I live in a state where the legislature said that when people are standing online in 90 degree heat, you cannot offer them water, Right. So before I worry about digital citizenship, I'm more worried about on the ground citizenship. Right. Not to say that it shouldn't be paid attention to, but I also can think of the harms that digital citizenship imposes. So Korea, uh, everybody who gets online has to have a digital uh, an ID. That's how they sign onto online. Right. That hasn't stopped their homophobia, their xenophobia, their racism. Right. Towards themselves and people who come in. Right. Um, and so. Uh, having di digital citizenship will solve the problems of modernity, how to track citizens, how to account for the movement, and you know whether they're paying taxes and stuff. But I don't know if it will necessarily solve the more complicated social and cultural problems that are engendered by people being people. Thank you. Okay, we have two more questions. The first one um, that I saw asked, how can you, if you're white, how can you be a good ally? Uh, listen. That's it. Um, and oh, the other part is so because there's a really uh, interesting thread that popped up on Twitter the other day. Uh, and this is for the academics, right? This one, this white woman came on and said, you know, if you're a junior scholar, don't be loud, don't push back, just be a quiet bunny until you get tenure, and then you can be um, um, be a fluffy bunny, right? And then you once you get tenure, then you can speak up. And I never had the option of being a fluffy bunny. I'm, close to 300 pounds. I'm six feet tall, right? I have a very loud laugh. There is no way that I, even if I just sat there and was quiet, they are ascribing certain things to my nature, right? And so if you're white and your black colleagues are being, especially the women, 
right? If a black woman says something and, there, and uh, some colleague is like, oh, that's stupid, but the white man says the same exact thing five minutes later and everybody's like, that's fantastic, speak up. That's when you don't need to be silent, right? Don't wait until after the meeting and say, oh, you were so brave. Or don't send a back channel message, right? The email, don't do that. Be an ally in the moment. Speak up when things are happening so that people can understand that you're forming a coalition. You are in solidarity with people who normally would be thrown under the bus. That's the best way allies can work. And thank you. And this last question, because I missed it when I first started, is from Charlotte. How do you think the use of AAVE on, oh no, it went away, hold on, online by white people, especially with the regard to the tendency of gay white men to take over sayings of black women fit in with digital black things. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. Um, so uh, queer folk have been really vocal over the last few years in arguing that their contributions to black culture are the most significant. Um, uh, I put the I put the blame on Beyonce. Um, but uh, I would argue that in any culture, it's the minoritized people who are often the ones who have to do workarounds right, in order to be seen or heard, right? And that goes double or triple, however you want to think about it intersectionally, right, for uh, Black queer folk, right? They, they want to be flamboyant in ways that confuse and upset people. So they do. They want, they come up with their own slang to describe the ways that they move through the world. And that slang, in part because they're Black, right, gains prominence in the way the world works. The issue with white queer folk is that they find solidarity in one part of their identity without relinquishing the whiteness that is really foundational to who they are, right? Uh, and the additional complication is that because the way, because the internet is a space that has transcended space and time and allows nearly instantaneous communication, but also archives of Black life, many Gen Z folk have access to the last 10 or 20 years of recorded televisual performance and sound performance without understanding or having access to or being immersed in, like I was as a Gen Xer, my parents' televisual and sound history, their struggles. Hold on, there's housekeeping right here. One second. My apologies. Where was I? Oh, um, so without that immersion and having so uh, my, my Gen X folks talk about this all the time. Right. We used to have to sit in the car on long road trips. Right. And listen to my parents music. It wasn't no you control the radio. Right. Similarly, we would have to sit in the living room and watch the shows they watched. Uh, and that was in some ways infrastructural, right? They just didn't have children's programming in the same way. You had a block of cartoons, 3 to 5 p.m., Monday through Friday, after your grandmother's stories, and you had some cartoons Saturday morning. Now you have 24-hour cartoons on multiple networks, right? Now you have Radio Disney, right? But also now you have, because children are difficult, now we give our kids devices so that they are not yelling in our ear or complaining about the fact that they are in the car with us for nine hours, right? And they use those devices even when the ride is five minutes. So now they're immersed in their own worlds where they find entertainment that is relevant to them, but they're also cut off from that immersion where I can explain why this particular jazz sample is central to a song that I grew up with in the 2000s that you have now recaptured as a sample in your music in 2020, right? So there's a loss of a community connection, right? Uh, and I think I'm answering this question correctly, right? So, and, but also the internet allows for uptake of black culture without that immersion, which leads to people appropriating, and this and this I'm comfortable in talking about, appropriating uh, black culture, black language. So I'm aware that uh, for a while, uh, Gen Z folk on TikTok were saying, that's not African-American vernacular, that's just internet talk, right? We've always talked like that. And I'm like, no, Chad, you don't talk like that when you're around black people, right? <laughs> you only do it on the internet. Right. And so appropriation will always happen um, because that's the nature of modernity in the West. Right. Uh, but African American vernacular English, uh, even though, uh, and this may be a controversial thing to say, most Black folk don't speak AAVE. They know it when they hear it, they understand it when it's said. So my favorite example is the phrase, woo child, W H E W C H I L E. Right. When I say it, 
or Dr. Cook say, if I say, child, right? You know, I'm expressing frustration or simply amazement that something stupid actually happened and people survived it, right? But in the internet, where it's largely textual or it's televisual, so the TikTok video where you don't see the spelling, some of these Gen Zers are like, oh, what do you mean when you say Wu Chile? What, who, what? <laughs> or if you want to get really technical with it, um, on iOS, I typed Wu Chile, right? And iOS auto-corrected C-H-I-L-E to the country C-H-I-L-E. And I'm like, first of all, iOS, 99 times out of 100, I don't care about the country Chile, right? And I'm saying child, I mean the African-American vernacular expression of child, right? Um, and so there are many ways that things can be misappropriated or misunderstood, right? Uh, and we can't necessarily control that, right? But we can push back in ways sometimes, or just shake your head and let it go. Every, you ain't gotta be in every fight, right? Uh, uh, if, they're, if, they're, if they're doing it something that is oppressive to you personally, as opposed to just irritating, child, let them have it. Let them have it. Keep it moving. That's part of Black optimism too. The understanding that every fight ain't your fight. And you can't let things irritate you because there are other things that are seriously more oppressive that you have to deal with on an everyday basis. How's that? Perfect. Thank you so much. I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much for today's presentation. Your lecture was amazing. I learned so much and I feel like everyone in the chat did as well. Um, I also want to send a special thank you to the School of Library and Information Science at the University of Iowa for co-sponsoring today's presentation. Please connect with Dr. Brock online. His Twitter is right. I don't have you, Twitter. So I don't have to oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. You can find him online yourself, friends. <laughs> As a reminder, this session has been recorded, so I will send it out to you all this weekend. Please reach out if you have any questions or concerns and get excited because the Augusta Baker Diversity Lecture Series will be back before you know it. Thank you all. Bye bye. Don't cut me off yet. How was that, Cook and Lucy? That was good. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, very so good. I especially appreciate the conversation afterwards. I, you really are good on that Q&A. I have to say, I love when you parcel out your thoughts. I told you this is slightly different, right? Uh, so this is the grown-up version, Cook, of the talk I gave on uh, Wednesday. And I was stumbling on Wednesday because I was trying to, to make it more accessible. But this